Hey everyone, thanks for uh, coming to check out my channel at Cursed to Toil Wood Crafts. Um, I mostly make pins, so you, that's what you're going to see me here is making a Razorback, Arkansas Razorback style pin out of olive wood. And this is going to be olive wood with red crushed opal and black tourmaline for the inlay. So here I am turning the blank down. I don't turn it down to the size that I want it to be yet, so that when I engrave it, um, you have to clean up a lot of the engraving and the inlay and you lose quite a bit of size doing that. So I always turn it down quite a bit bigger than what I want the final product to be. So you'll see as I get here, you know, I'm already sanding it down. I'll turn it down a little more after this, but we'll see. Uh, I like these to be a pretty low profile end product. And as soon as I get done, you know, you get a lot of heat from sanding and doing that. So I always, I always hit the blanks with denatured alcohol before I engrave them. Just to clean them up. So here you can see there's a few little superficial cracks. These are just wood grain cracks. They're not, um, they're not from turning or anything. They were there before I started. So I point those out because I like to clean them up. And before I even start engraving or carving, I'll inlay these cracks with uh, some fine opal or some other inlay material. Here I'm using the red opal and a thin CA glue to fix it in place. And right there you'll see that I've got a Kawasaki Dremel, well it's Kawasaki rotary tool. And this is where people want a lot of information on what I'm doing here, so. If you'll notice, I am, I'm carving these with a diamond blade and you know, you're right to think that you don't carve wood with a diamond blade. But I do it with that because the diamond blade doesn't cut very well. And the result of that is you actually get a tremendous level of control. And you know, it, it, you really have to be intentional on where you're going. So it gives you a lot of control. It, it allows me to um, get through the, the grain differences because each, each grain line is a little different density than the rest of it. So if you're, not careful, it will, it will make all your lines jarry and have these little jerk lines in them. So I do these initial lines with the diamond blade. It's a one inch diamond blade. They're really cheap to get. But because they cut so poorly, you can see that it actually burns a line in underneath the engraving. This is actually really good so that if you have different types of inlay material, you, a, a back plane of black is usually pretty handy. But I cleaned some of that up too, so it doesn't it doesn't all land through here. But just look at the, the grain pattern on that olive wood, isn't that beautiful? Now one thing I want to point out here that I'm doing is when I'm engraving like this, I'm wearing the glove there on my right hand, and that's because that, that rotary tool is exhausting right on my hands through those little cracks. And after about two minutes or so it'll get so hot it will it will eventually blister your hands and uh so I, I started using a glove and that fixed that problem. I tried to hold it like a pencil, but if you'll watch my fingers, I have to be touching both of my hands together, whether it's just uh, two pinkies touching each other or my ring fingers. But if you look in every position that I'm carving, I stabilize my hands against each other so that I can carve, right? So you can see right there, I'm trying to find a good position here because you do have to do the carving with both hands so each hand is moving to get these lines in there so i've done that now what i do next is i put an actual wood carving bit in and you're going to see me kind of uh, mess with it a little bit and you can't really tell in the video but what it is is if that bit doesn't lock in just the right way and you don't double check it you may actually have a little bit of wobble on it. And if you get wobble on that thing, then you will not get the fine lines that you need. It'll, it'll probably double or triple the width of the inlay channel that you're trying to do. And it also give, um, it tears up the wood pretty well. So you get it in there, see right there, you can't see it, but it does have a wobble to it. So I'm about to take it off again, reposition it and make sure it gets in there. And the best way to check for that wobble is to look at the very, very point of it right there 
tighten it up. All right, check it in there. Yeah, I didn't have any wobble. So now because I have these groove lines already in from the diamond blade, I use this small wood carving bit to kind of just go and clean those lines up. Get any of those jerking lines out of there. They're, they're almost unavoidable. So even if you're very careful and all that, you tend to get them. And, you know, keep in mind these blanks are very small. They're, they're barely two inches long. And I mean, at this point, they're probably five eighths wide. And so, you know, it, it doesn't, it might look pretty simple here, but it's actually quite a task to keep this all controlled. So I go through and I, I kind of clean these channels up with that wood carving bit. And usually the channel guides the bit for you. And if you're careful and you're smooth, then it goes. I also use this to uh, put little accent holes. Um, I like to do this in my pen. You'll see the end product and what it does. Um, I start with little holes and then I um, they graduate up as I go and I try to put a little little curve to them and it just gives a nice little accent to the other designs that I'm putting in this pin. Do the same thing on the next one and what's coming up in a second is you're going to see the inlay. And like I said before, we're inlaying with uh, crushed black tourmaline for the black color and uh, red bellow opal for the red. And once that's cast, that, that lands right at this nice, um, somewhere between crimson and red color, which I think is, is a very good match for the Razorback, the Arkansas Razorbacks theme. This pin is actually a gift that I'm making for my next door neighbor. And you can see I'm just kind of making sure there's all the lines are clean and if there's you know little jerk lines here and there I put a little extra effort and I go a little slower here so that I can get those lines cleaned up you do not want to go fast in this part and like I said this whole process is about two hours long so it's uh you, know, you want to be careful and you want to take your time and right about now is when that, that rotary tool would be so hot that you'd have to take breaks and uh, set it down and let it cool off, but uh, just so you could touch it. But I found with this leather glove, I can, I can hold that thing and, and I can go for quite a long time without it causing any kind of problems. And the tool itself doesn't seem to be sustaining any kind of damage or anything from getting that hot. It's just, I don't think you're supposed to hold it in the position that I'm holding it. So you do have to make sure you're not covering all of the vents otherwise you'll overheat it and burn it out but this Kawasaki I can't even find these anymore but this is a, a fantastic variable speed rotary tool if you can find one it's a one amp Kawasaki it's fantastic I'm not being sponsored or anything by them though if they would sponsor me and send me a new one that would be fantastic but you can see I've only got like a hundred followers it's not gonna happen So you can see here there's a couple times I'm balancing my hand against the blank and not against my see there it's against my fingers every time I try to do it without stabilizing my hands together I end up making mistakes so I would say if you're gonna try this just make sure your hand positions are stabilized to one another and and not other stuff because it just doesn't work out as well that way at least for me that's how it works so even if I have to touch my pinkies or a pinky to a thumb or a ring finger to a middle finger, just some sort of stable together. But you can see these designs now. And I always go with like a sort of tribal type of design. This is my black tourmaline. And with tourmaline, keep in mind, it's a natural stone. So it does have other things that aren't solid black in it that are just part of uh, like a matrix or, a, you know, some extra stuff that's maybe not the solid black that tourmaline shows in like pictures and stuff but you can't really tell this this actually came out really well so i'm doing all these accent dots i'm covering them i do everything that i can in one color at the top surface of the blank and then i put some thin ca in there let it keep going i go as far as i can before i cure it because i don't if you cure too many times too often you'll actually fill your other channels with ca and then you won't have any room to inlay them 
You can see that every time you see me pull off, that's me curing it. And I cure it off the other direction because I keep my glue right there. If I cure it right here, I'll blow my inlay around and some of that uh, activator may land on the nozzle of my glue and then it will plug my glue up on the next turn. So I try not to do that. I'm trying to get some of the inlay out that fell into some of the channels there. So. so I go through and get all the black dots in, get those filled. I'm gonna go and do the black here. Um, ideally, you wanna do all of the color that you're gonna do for both pieces in the same setting. You don't, you don't wanna finish one blank completely and then go back to another color that you've already been using previously. You'll, you'll end up mixing, uh, inadvertently getting some, some contamination of colors between one another if you're not careful. So like this one, I'm doing all the black first. And then when I get done, I'll do any cleanup that I need to do. And then I'm gonna do all the red after that. Most of this video is sped up. This specific part, I, I slowed down to do, um, I think it was like two and a half speed, maybe two speed. But I slowed this down. The rest of the video is quite a bit faster, but I slowed this down so that you can kind of see more of what I'm doing. Cause this, this part is what seems to be different than what a lot of pen turners are doing. Is this level of inlay, it takes a lot of care, a lot of time, but the results are pretty fantastic. And I can, I can sell these slimline pens. I do upgrade the parts inside of them. So I put upgraded ink cartridges and I put upgraded Diacom transmissions in them to increase the mechanical quality of it. Slimlines are notoriously known as the lowest quality pen that you can make by hand. And so I, I take that as a particular kind of challenge to See if I can't increase that quality with, with labor and you know being careful and taking my time and doing it. This is part of why Curse to Toil Woodcrafts, this is this is part of what I like to do is take something where the value is not much and use my own labor and my own artistic capabilities to to step up that quality as high as I can get it. And you know, this pen right here, I could sell the Anywhere from, you know, it depends on if it's a friend or if it's just, you know, how I do it. But typically it's $75 to $100 a pen for this style of kit. And that, that goes up pretty drastically with uh, the pen kit. So if I did a higher quality kit, I, I can usually sell those no problem. And even with the video and the end pictures and that kind of stuff, it's not going to do justice to what this actually looks like in person. This Bellow Opal, it, it shines like diamonds with the whole color profile for each of the uh, bits that you're playing with. So this red will reflect orange, yellow, red, and purple. And that's the color profile of that Opal, or the Opalescent profile. Now this whole pro, this whole pen uses uh, right around one gram of Opal in the whole pen. So with the Opal and the Tourmaline, and the pen kit and the blank, you know, the, the value, the material value is, I'd say, probably right around $25. And then, you know, it depends on what you count labor as to what type of value you would add to it with that. But if I do add labor to it, I am still selling these at a loss because the, the amount of time I'm putting in there is, I try to say that you should really pay yourself anywhere from 15 to $30 an hour, depending on what you're doing. If this is two hours, then at $15 an hour, that's, that's an additional $30. And now we're sitting at $55 just, just to build it. And now here I'm mixing uh, tourmaline and the red opal so that I can have a black and red mix for a larger inlay channel. And this bit right here actually did not go as planned. That, that channel ended up a lot wider than I wanted it to be. And that was the one part of this pen where my fingers 
were not touching each other when I was trying to fix the grooves and stuff. So I, it, it wound up wobbling and widening that channel more than I wanted it to. So rather than it just being solid pitch black, I figured I would do a little mix here and just have one little accent strike through the pin that is black and red together. And you'll see what that looks like at the end of it, but you can see that kind of mix there. Forgive me for not showing the pin directly in the center of the screen. This is a new shop setup since I recently moved. So I will be refining that as we do more videos. So now I've got all that in there. The first thing I want to do, I want to knock off the hard edges with some uh, 150 grit sandpaper. And now I'm using my tool to get that back down to the wood size. You can get uh, quite a bit of tear out if you're not careful and you'll have to redo a lot of this. The tricky part of these pins is that to get a good finish with this kind of inlay, you kind of have to go back and forth and do stuff over and over and over again. So here I'm pointing out all these little divots. So now I'm using a medium C, excuse me, a medium CA glue to fill in any uh, voids that are left in there. So you fill those in, keep it turning, cure it. Try not to get too much glue on your tracks and your other components because that causes problems later. But if you keep a wet denatured alcohol paper towel with you, that will clean that glue up pretty quick before it cures. So here, you can always see uh, where the glue is. That's how I know when I'm getting down to where I can start sanding again, is I get um, any of what looks like the darkened wood off of there. And now I'm sanding it. Here, you really need to use your fingers to feel for what you're doing while it's turning. But each step of this process takes the uh, profile of the pin blanks down. No matter how you want to do it, you're gonna you're gonna take some material and some wood off of there every time. This right this process right here is why I keep the blank bigger when I start engraving it because now I'm you're gonna see I'm gonna turn it down again. And you can see that shine is going away and you don't want the shine at this point. You want to get rid of all of that so that you know you're cleaning down to the channel size. You don't have extra CA sitting up there. Always cross sand. And now I go through my, my sandpaper grit. So I start at 150, cross sand, and go to 240, cross sand. And I go to, I believe 320, then 400, and then 600. And at 600, I cross sand, and then I start with my CA finish, which is coming up in just a moment. Now, when you do an inlay project like this, even if you really like the grain of the wood and you like doing natural finishes or oil-based finishes or you know wax-based finishes, whatever you want to do, they don't really work out if you do an inlay on it like this, this type of inlay. You can do some inlays and it's, and it's just fine. But really for this to come out the way that is uh, the most beautiful, the most impressive to see and to hold, it needs to be a mirror glass finish on this pin. And that takes quite a bit of work. Now you'll see that I'm not using um, the Teflon bushings that are recommended for doing a CA finish because I have found that I don't like those. I have more I have more peeling problems on the CA coat doing that than I do using regular bushings here and I'll show you how I kind of mitigate that. So my first thing is I'm probably going to do between five and ten coats of thin CA here and it's really important to clean the activator off of each layer so that you're not uh, curing the new layer of CA too quickly. So now I'm filling voids again, right? So here we go. And now this part gets a little tricky because now I've got um, what feel kind of like warts of CA from filling these new voids. So I'm using my finger on the back side to feel when it gets back to true. And then I'm starting with the 400, I believe. Scuff that up, cross sand, and then 600. And that cleans that finish back up. And then I go back with another coat of CA, do thin, and now I'm gonna do two coats of medium to thicken that coat up. You want, you want a thick coat, you don't want it crazy, but if it's too thin, then once you get through the polishing, you're gonna find little uh, 
spots that have worn through the CA finish and you're going to have to start all over. And I can tell you that's incredibly frustrating and adds another 20 to 30 minutes to this process. So now I'm doing the polishing coat and I'm sanding all the way up through 12,000 grit. And then I finish it with the polish. I just use that little uh, measuring cup with some ice cold water. I, I've been experimenting with seeing if like a, a distilled water or soda water or different types of uh, essentially fluids give me different results, but that's just my own experimenting. Now here, I am doing my final polish, and I am using Meguiar's Ultimate Automotive Compound. I have better luck and better results with this than anything that I can find. And people tell me all sorts of other stuff that I should try and use, and, and they can do that right there. I'm using this point, right? And I'm just scoring the CA so that when I pull it off, it's got a break point. And then it, I have never had this break into the pin. And there you can see my bits. It's like a, you know, you can, you, I can catch a reflection in there. You can, you can see that it, it's a beautiful finish right there. I, I apologize that we're not centered on the screen, but I'll get better at that. And here's the end product right here. And this is a beautiful pen. Thank you all for watching my channel and watching me make this pen. It was a lot of fun to make, and I just hope that you'll uh, follow along for other pens as I start cranking them out again. Thanks, everyone. God bless you.